morning, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I'm Amber, the Public Science Events Manager here at the Bell Museum. And as you probably noticed, I'm sporting my lovely face mask today. Um, that is because I'm actually on site at the museum. We are indeed open again to a limited number of people through advanced ticket sales. And this week is actually just for our members, but everyone is welcome back beginning on July 23rd. Advanced ticket reservations are required to help make sure that we have the right number of people in the building. So please check our website for more details. We are throughout this time gonna be continuing our online programming. And I'm happy to say that this morning, I'm joined by Heather, our gallery programs coordinator. Heather is also a Minnesota master naturalist and a trained entomologist. She is passionate about insects and is here today to teach us more about moths and to get everyone excited for National Moth Week. I didn't even know there was a National Moth Week. <laughs> if you have a question for her, please enter it into the comment box here, box here on Facebook. I'll be watching closely and we'll get to as many questions as we possibly can today. Thanks again for joining us. Now I'm gonna turn things over to Heather. Heather, thanks for joining us. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Amber. I'm really excited to be here with everyone this morning. Um, and as Amber was saying, we are open. I was working at the museum yesterday. It was really great to get to see visitors again and um, have everything turned on. So I hope some of you are able to swing by sometime this week or next week when we're open to everybody. Um, you're probably hearing some sounds in the background. I'm in my backyard. The crows are very active this morning, <laughs> um, but I will try to talk over them. Um, and I'm so excited to get to share what I think is a really magical world of moths uh, with all of you. Um, as Amber was saying, I am a trained entomologist and um, for my master's degree, I worked specifically with moths. Um, I worked with parasitic wasps for my undergraduate work. We'll talk about that some other time. <laughs> um, but with that, I want to kind of introduce to you why I think moths are so cool. Um, they're an incredibly diverse group of organisms for start. Um, so a lot of times when we think about moths, we might just think about, oh, these drab kind of brown or gray things that just fly aimlessly toward lights at night. Um, and that is what a lot of them look like and do. But there are also some really, really colorful ones. And I have some of those to show you today. Um, and we also have some colorful ones here in Minnesota. So it's not just uh, reserved for places like the tropics. Um, but Amber, if you want to throw up that first slide that I have, um, slide number two, I'll show you what uh, kind of how moths come into play as far as diversity of life on the planet go. Um, <clears throat> are we up, Amber? Uh, no, just one moment. Sorry. Okay. No worries. Uh, It'll time be fine in in slide. just a moment. Um, but insects are um, a huge part of the diversity of life on Earth. And when we talk about diversity of life, we are talking in large part about the different numbers of species that we um, know about and, and also estimate to um, be in existence. So um, <clears throat> insects and other arthropods, other invertebrates similar to insects like spiders and things like that, um, actually make up about 70% of the life that we know on Earth. Um, and then insects on their own make up um, about 80% of that. So that's really exciting. Um, thinking about moths and butterflies in particular. Uh, so they are in the order of insects called Lepidoptera. Um, and when we think about moths and butterflies, uh, we'll talk about the differences in a little bit, but we often think of them as very separate groups, but they are one group altogether. Um, and right now there are about 175,000 described species of Lepidoptera, so moths and butterflies. Um, and we estimate that there are actually closer to something like 300,000 to 500,000 species. Um, so when we say described species, that just means things that we um, in Western science have recognized and been able to identify as a, a separate individual species. But there are so many more that we don't know about yet um, and we just haven't come across. And that's true across everything, plants, animals, whatever it might be. Um, and then as we're thinking about um, 
moths and butterflies in relation to insect diversity, so the, the number of insect species, moths and butterflies, that group of Lepidoptera, they make up about 16% of insect diversity, which is a pretty huge chunk of that pie you can see on that slide there. Um, I think that's super exciting. Um, people who study beetles like to uh, sort of pull out the card that their group is the most diverse group, which is true. Um, and we can't forget about all the other ones. Um, but as we're thinking about moths and butterflies in Minnesota as well, I wanted you to know that we have um, about 161 species of butterflies in Minnesota and a massive 370 species of moths in Minnesota. And remember, those are just the ones that we know about. Um, we know a, a great deal about the, the diversity of life in Minnesota, but there are definitely uh, likely still some that we don't know about. Um, so if you're wondering about what makes moths and butterflies different from other insects, um, and there are a few things that stand out for this group of Lepidoptera. So the biggest is that uh, their wings are covered in scales, um, which might sound kind of strange. You might think of scales as just being something for fish. Um, but if you think about if you've ever held a butterfly or a moth and you've gotten that powdery substance on your fingers, those are their scales. And their teeny tiny scales often do look just like fish scales. Um, and some of the scale structure, the, the physical shape of the scale can actually contribute to what their coloration is. Um, so if you think about the really bright blue, um, almost iridescent butterflies, those, it's not blue coloration, it's actually light interacting with the structure of the scales on their wings, which I think is really exciting. Um, some other things that pull this group together is that they have a coiled proboscis. The proboscis is that long tongue that they'll unfurl so they can get nectar out of flowers. Um, or if they're males, they'll often um, use their proboscis to take up salts and other minerals from things on the ground. So if you see a group of often butterflies during the day um, and they're clumped around something and kind of fluttering around the ground, that's called puddling. And they are taking up a lot of nutrients and things like that to be able to actually make a gift to give to the female when they mate so that she has a lot of really good nutrients so she can go do the hard work of laying the eggs, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and then another thing that pulls Lepidoptera together is that most adults feed on nectar and pollen. And when we're thinking about the differences, um, you're probably not going to like my answer to this question. We actually, it's very hard to differentiate butterflies and moths into really separate groups. The best way that I can describe it to you is that the butterflies are a, a specific group within the moths and the moths kind of all cluster around them um, when we're thinking about their relationships um, on sort of their family tree, their evolutionary tree. But some of the things that typically stand out as differences between them is that um, moths will typically or very often have those really feathery antennae. And I have a, a nice photograph of a polyphemus moth there at the bottom of that little cluster of three uh, photographs. You can see it has those really nice feathery antennae. Um, and then butterflies will typically have straight or clubbed antennae. And when I say clubbed, I mean they have almost like a little ball at the tip. Um, but they don't always have that. And the same with moths. They don't always have those feathery antennae. Um, skippers, which are uh, another group sort of within the butterflies, they, and you can see the, um, the little photograph up in the top corner there next to the tiger swallowtail is a skipper. Um, but they usually have those kind of clubbed or hooked antennae. So they can look a lot like butterflies. And if you're wondering about skippers, they look like they're skipping through the air. Um, and so if you see a butterfly that looks like it's kind of flying, like it's really hyper or something, that's probably a skipper. Um, and I also wanted to show you some examples of um, moths that we see in Minnesota that I think are really really cool. And you might recognize some of these. So Amber, we can go ahead and move on to the slide number six. So the woolly bear caterpillar, which is a, a really well-known caterpillar in Minnesota. We love these caterpillars when they come out in the spring and the fall. You'll often see them crossing 
sidewalks and things like that. But I also wanted to show you what the moth of that caterpillar looks like. So it's the Isabella tiger moth. And tiger moths are actually the group of moths that I studied. So they have a very special place in my heart. <laughs> um, but those are really fun and they're really beautiful moths, I think. We can go to the next one, Amber. So the next one that's coming up are the yellow um, bear caterpillars. So these are similar to the woolly bear, but they, as their name suggests, are yellow. And their moth, I think, is also another really gorgeous moth, is the Virginia tiger moth. And it's that really lovely pearly white. It has that nice kind of bushy head going on, and it often has a very faint little dark spot on its wing that you might be able to see in that slide. And the next one. This next one, you saw a photograph of it earlier with its really lovely feathery antennae. This is a polyphemus moth. It gets its name from the Greek legend about the Cyclops. Um, and this is a really big moth that we get here in Minnesota. Um, if you see cocoons that look like um, almost like a really big uh, jelly bean or a really squished down marshmallow um, that's kind of a, a pearly color. That is probably a polyphemus cocoon, um, which is really fun. I often find these when I'm walking um, in the fall or the early spring as they've overwintered, they've kind of hibernated. And I will sometimes bring those home and um, put them in something like one of these, just a little a net cage and wait to see who comes out of it. Sometimes I forget to put them in a container and then randomly we have a moth flying around the house. And my husband always tells me there's a moth flying around the house. <laughs> um, but they're really cool moths. They are pretty slow flyers, so they're really fun to observe too. And we can go to that next slide that's a, a cluster of different moths just to give you um, a quick rundown of a lot more of the diversity that we have of moths here in Minnesota. Um, so the, the top left is the beautiful wood nymph, which I think is a lovely name for it. Um, they have that really fun posturing behavior where they stick their legs out in front of them. The next one uh, there in the middle at the top is a painted lichen moth. Um, and we'll see those a lot around this time, especially um, in wooded areas. They'll come out a lot. In the top right corner is the topiary grass veneer moth, and I think their, their color patterns are really gorgeous. They look so fancy and elegant to me, um, and they do, as their name suggests, hang out in grasses. Um, and then moving down to that bottom row on the left, we have a squash borer. Now, if you're a gardener, these are probably not your friends. <laughs> um, their caterpillars will just kind of annihilate the squash, uh, the squash stems and down into the roots. Um, so they can cause a really, really, pro really big problems if you're trying to grow any variety of squash. But the moth, which is the adult form, is, I think, really gorgeous, has some really fun, stunning colors, some blues and oranges in there. And then that next one in the middle on the bottom is actually a day flying moth. So not all moths fly at night. Um, and it's, it's called a grape leaf skeletonizer. I actually found this out at um, the Rice Creek North Regional Trail um, maybe about a month ago. Um, so that, that was a really fun find. They're really showy. They've got that bright orange collar and those really glossy black wings. And then the last one with the purple background there is a dimorphic tosail moth. Um, and they have that really cute posture where they stick their tails up in the air um, and just kind of perch themselves out. They look very proud to me. So I just wanted to give you a quick rundown of um, some of the diversity of moths that we have here in Minnesota. Um, Amber, do we want to take some questions? Do we want to look at some specimens that came around my house last night? I think it would be great if you could show us a few specimens and I will yeah. take a look on Facebook and see if we've had any questions roll in. All right, excellent. So I'm going to actually try to get this one out of the little container I've got it in. It's a little bit more slow moving. And so I think I can show it to you a little bit better if it comes out. We'll see if it stays put for us. So I'm going to turn my camera around. Okay. So Amber, is that showing up clear? Let me take a look. Yes, we are able to see it. Excellent. So this is a banded tussock moth. I think this is another really beautiful moth. It's in um, that kind of group 
near tiger moths. So they're related to each other. And you might not be able to see quite as well. And the sun is kind of blinding me right now. (laughs) Um, But it has some really nice patterns on its wings. And oftentimes, this one is a bit older, so it's probably nearing the end of its life. But when they first emerge, um, they have some really bright blue flashes up near their head where it's kind of furry there. So this is one that I think is really fun. I don't know if you can see its little face. Oh, it's going on a trip. All right. So this one I think is done. Let me grab another one for you. I might have to keep this one on my hand. It does not seem to want to go away. All right. So this one, let's see. Is that coming through okay, Amber, or is it too dark? We we are able to see it. It's a it's a little dark, but I think we're able to see it. Is that better? Uh, Nope, it was actually better before with your hand. All right. So this is one of those lichen moths that was on one of those slides earlier. Um, And so you can see it has those really cool uh, kind of bands on its wings, stripes. It's got some yellows and oranges, and they're a really cool moth. Um, When you can see them up close, they, they look just really sleek and really well put together. Dapper little moths, you could say. (laughs) And then I've got another one in this same jar that is one of those uh, grass veneer moths. I have to take a look at my field guides to figure out exactly which species of those moths it is, but um, it is one of those and they're pretty cool. I think I'll also show you, so my, um, flip my camera back around for you. My research was actually focusing on moths that are um, more limited to the southwest of the U.S., although we do get a couple of the species up here. Um, But I want to show you some of the the really bright colors that moths can have. So that is a hawk (laughs) that is a juvenile and is really active. So this little guy is kind of near that group of tiger moths. They're all in this large family called Eribidae. Um, and so it's tiger moths and sort of their cousins, you could say. Um, but I don't know if you can see those colors coming through, but it's got this really bright, vibrant kind of orangish pink. Um, and then the back edge of its wings are really dark gray. So it's really striking. Grab another one here for you. This next one that I'll show you, um, it actually has some transparency on its wings. So up here at the top corner where it looks very light, there is some yellow, but there's also almost like a little window there, which is pretty cool. Um, And then it has a really bright pink abdomen. It's really fun. So again, these are ones that we'll find in the Southwest US as opposed to here in Minnesota. And I will show you one of the species that I actually studied. So this is called Eucades zella. So the the smaller group within Lepidoptera and within its family, Eribidae, that this moth belongs to is Eucades. It's called a genus. Um, And then its species is zella. And the the name zella comes from um, the, the wife of the person who described it. It was her name. But it's a really cute little moth. Um, It's got another bright pink abdomen and those dark gray front wings and its hind wings are really bright, light white. How are we doing, Amber? We ready for some questions? More specimens? Uh, No, we've actually had a couple of questions come in if if you'd be interested in in answering them. Um, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the first question comes from Samantha and Samantha is actually wondering what the average lifespan of a moth is? Yeah, so that can vary a lot. Um, A lot of the larger moths um, 
they they don't live very long at all. They basically have one job when they um, come out as adults. Emma, can you still see me? Yes, we are able okay. to see you. Camera is showing me some weird stuff here. Sorry. So, Samantha, um, a lot of the larger moths, like that polyphemus moth that I showed you, um, or if you think about maybe like a Luna moth, like my earrings today, um, they live just for a few days. Their their main job when they emerge from their cocoon as adults is to find a mate so they can reproduce and make more of that moth, but starting with the caterpillar form. So they'll lay the eggs and then the eggs develop into caterpillars, which then develop into a pupa inside of a cocoon or a chrysalis. And then from there, they emerge as the adult. So they're often very short-lived in their, their moth stage. It's a great question. And I should say too that those kinds of life history details are a lot of what we're still learning about a lot of insects, especially, is how long they live as adults um, and kind of what, what all they're doing. So there are actually a lot of unknowns um, when it comes to the answer to that question. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. The next question comes from Beckett and Beckett wants to know why it is that the moths like to eat squash. <laughs> Beckett, that's a great question. So the moth as an adult isn't eating the squash. It's the caterpillar. I don't know if you um, have are familiar with the children's story, The Hungry, Hungry Caterpillar, but uh, they like to eat. <laughs> the caterpillars have to eat a lot. And a lot of um, different organisms, plants, animals, birds, when we think about where they live in their ecosystem, they have to have a balance. So not everything eats all of the same plant or same kind of animal if they're a predator. Um, and so this moth, the squash borer moth in particular, um, somewhere along the line, its caterpillars decided that they really liked eating the squash vine. Um, so I'm not exactly sure why they chose that one in particular. Um, I would guess it has a lot to do with um, what kinds of foods were available early on in in the, the history of that moth on the planet. So um, probably a long time ago. But they, a lot of moths like to eat lots of different kinds of things in their caterpillar stage. Um, so if you are familiar with the, um, the monarch butterfly, for example, its caterpillars really like milkweed. And there are some moths that their caterpillars also like to eat the milkweed. Um, one is the, the Eukades tussock moth, which is actually one of the, the species that I studied too. Um, so they all like to, they have a, a different favorite food, you could say. I don't like people. <laughs> exactly. Just like people. We're not so different. <laughs> um, the next question comes from Hannah. And Hannah's wondering if you catch a moth and you want to be able to kind of observe it and build a habitat for it, what is, yeah. what is the best way to do that? Is there a certain type of mesh cage or what, what works best? Yeah. So, um, you can often find these little pop-up cages like I have, and it's pretty small and it squishes down pretty compact. Um, they're, you know, at toy stores. I've seen these at Target before. Um, so you can get those almost anywhere, but you don't need something that specific either. Um, if you have a peanut butter jar or a, a good size but clear Tupperware container, that'll work just fine too. Um, and I think probably the biggest thing to remember is that the moths, the adult stage of, of these insects, they don't live that long. Um, so you might just want to observe it for a day or so and then let it go so it can go do what it needs to do, lay eggs or find a mate, whatever that might be. Um, but caterpillars, that's where you can really do a lot of building a habitat and, and kind of watching them develop. Um, so something to make sure to look out for if you do collect a caterpillar that you want to, it's called rear, that you want to raise, you could say, um, make sure that you... Uh, get a good look at the plant that it's on and make sure that you've seen it eating that plant. Um, you can also identify the, the caterpillar online or using an app like the iNaturalist app. Um, and so you can get an idea of who it is if you weren't able to see what it was eating. And then you should be able to find some information about what kinds of host plants, what plants it likes to eat. And then you'll just want to make sure that you gather fresh plants for it um, probably every day. They eat a lot and you might want to gather more than you think they'll need. Um, and then making sure that it's a, a cool environment, especially in a place like Minnesota, most of our caterpillars are going to need some moisture and humidity um, to really be able to grow and stay healthy. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
You know, before we head out, I, I actually have one question for you. Um, yeah. I think it's it's more just about over time as you've been studying moss and insects, what to you is the most interesting thing that you've collected or seen um, that got you most excited? So that's a very hard question for me to answer. Um, even harder is the question of what's my favorite insect. <laughs> we won't go there today. <laughs> um, but for me, I, I really fell in love with... Um, the behavior of the group of moths that I studied, the Eukates moths within tiger moths. Um, and tiger moths, I should say too, are some of the showiest moths that there are. They have some of the brightest colorations. Um, they occur here in the U.S. They occur in the U.K., in the tropics. Um, in the U.K., they like to put them on their stamps. That's how fancy they are. Um, but a lot of the moths within that group and other moth groups as well, and butterflies certainly do this too, um, they, they engage in what's called chemical defense. So if we think about um, caterpillars that are eating plants that can be poisonous to us humans and a lot of other um, birds or mammals, like, like the milkweed, for example, they're able to actually use the toxins in that plant and store it in their little bodies as a chemical defense. And so um, a lot of birds that like to eat caterpillars, oftentimes they'll learn pretty early on, like, oh, don't eat the ones that look like that because they'll make me throw up. They're, they taste really bad. They make me feel sick. Um, and so they have this really great built-in defense mechanism. Um, and then they will often be able to actually carry that protection with them into the adult stage um, and to, to give them a little extra protection while they're trying to find a mate and reproduce, which is a really important part of the life cycle, making that next generation. Um, so I think that's really cool um, for that group of moths. And so it's, it's hard for me to pick one species, Amber. <laughs> um, but... The Eukates egli, which is the, the primary species that I worked on, it's that the other caterpillar that we can find on our milkweed here, they have really bright, tufty hairdos of orange and white and black. Um, they are super cool to me. I think they're just really awesome. Um, and they're, they're a ton of fun. And they're one of the hairy caterpillars that you can pick up and they won't hurt you like woolly bears. Um, but a lot of hairy caterpillars that look really cute and cuddly, their, their hairs can actually sting. It's, that's part of their defense mechanism. So be very cautious if you're picking up caterpillars that are fuzzy or spiky. And as long as we're talking a little bit about woolly bears, another question came in from Maggie, and she is wondering what the woolly bear caterpillars eat. Oh, that's a great question. I don't know off the top of my head, but I do have a field guide right here. So I am going to see what that says. I don't, I've never thought about what they eat. I haven't paid that much attention. <laughs> so let me see if I can pull that up for you really quickly. Because that is a really excellent question. And this is a great example that I tell people all the time. People ask me to identify insects all the time. And I love helping with that. Um, but as you saw with the species diversity, there are so, so many species of insect and species of moths that no one person could possibly know it all. And so we all do still have to go do our research and look it up. I'm moving over to my caterpillar field guide really quick. So I think that'll be a better one. Where are you? You know, while you're looking for that, one of the other questions that came in was about someone who, who was trying to identify a caterpillar without success. And they're wondering yeah. what your favorite website or field guide is. Yes. So I will Facebook show you guide. this one. Um, if you're looking for a really quick way to identify all kinds of things, plants, um, birds, whatever it might be. I really like the iNaturalist um, application and it's free to download. You can put it on your smartphone. You can access it from a desktop computer as well. Um, and it's really great. It's really helpful. And it also contributes to citizen science. So it helps researchers who are looking to for data about where these organisms are occurring um, and just kind of getting a good idea of, of who's where and, and when. So that's a really great kind of catch-all place to get your identifications. Um, I also really like 
I'm not sure what's happening here. I really like this um, field guide for caterpillars. It's the um, caterpillars of Eastern North America. Um, so it's, it's good for Minnesota. There are going to be some species that we get here that won't occur in this one, um, but many of, of these species occur here. Um, and they're, they're just a ton, it's a ton of fun, this, this field guide. But I think they've got a mislabeled page number. So let me try this one more time. I was trying to cheat and get to it quickly and I should know better. <laughs> um, trying to think of other good field guides for identifying. Um, bug guide, I think it is .net is the website. Um, that one is, is also really, it's a really good site for all kinds of insects and you can submit a, a photograph that um, you need help identifying. And that's one of the things that I like about that one. Um, moths of, there we go. Um, moths and butterflies of North America is another um, really great website too. Um, it's put together by some of the, the most expert lepidopterist um, people who study moths and butterflies in the US and Canada. Um, and so that's another really great site that I would send people to. I have found the woolly bear, finally. So that's an example of what a page in this field guide looks like. So you can see that. Gives you a picture of the caterpillar and the adult. Um, and it says here that common food plants for woolly bears, um, they like a lot of different kinds of things. So they're not picky. Uh, they like dandelions, grass, they'll eat lettuce, um, and actually nettle as well. So they are, they should be pretty easy to get food for. Um, you should be able to even just go buy them a, a, a lettuce head from the grocery store. Make sure you wash it very well so that if there are any pesticide residues on it, um, it doesn't end up poisoning the caterpillar. But that's, that's what they like to eat. They're, they're generalists is what we would call them. They eat it all. Oh, love that. Thank you. Yeah. you know, sir, I'm sad to say that we're, we're out of time for today. Um, but I want to, I want to thank everyone for joining us and thank you in particular for sharing um, your love of moss and the world of moss. Yeah. Um, we hope that everyone finds some time in this, this next week to, to celebrate national moth week and to get outside and to do some observing of their own. Um, and uh, I wanted to also let everyone know that our next live program is going to be coming up on Thursday, July 23rd at four o'clock. And at that time, we're going to be talking to um, our curator of plants, Ya Yang, about um, her current projects and work. And so we, we hope that you'll join us at that time for that next live event. Um, we'll also be continuing to answer questions that maybe come up in Facebook and also post some additional links um, in the comments um, about ways that you can help support Bell Live programming like this as we continue to do these live events. So thank you once again, Heather, for joining us today. Um, I want to hope that everyone has a wonderful day.